The Seattle General Strike of 1919 was a massive revolt by the people against their government because hundreds of thousands of people came together demanding payment for their labor. A hard-won compromise was reached, resulting in fair wages for future workers' benefit. The First World War had just ended, and wages for workers were at an all-time low. The government said they would pay the workers at the end of the war for all their hard work. But they went back on their promise. The government needed ships for the war, and the people building those ships needed to be paid. But they didn't get compensated. They were building ships to win the war, and they believed that their time had now come for a raise. And the management of the shipyards basically said no. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back. The Seattle General Strike of 1919 was the first of its kind. No other strike like this had occurred in U.S. history. This was not your typical strike. It was an extremely peaceful one. Not a single gunshot was fired, nor any person assaulted. No arrests were made, and there were no deaths as a result of the strike. The revolt started as a shipyard strike, but once others joined the movement in solidarity, it quickly turned into a general strike. It all started on the morning of January 21st, with the shipyard workers striking first. But by that evening, the Metal Trades Association had proposed a general strike as well. Following this, the Central Labor Council, consisting of delegates from 110 unions, gathered together to decide whether they should strike or not. After many difficult meetings to discuss and work out the details of the possibility of an impending strike, Seattleites began to understand the realities of what a general strike would actually entail and how it could affect their community as a whole. The issues of individual union exemptions, labor contracts, and the management of daily life for the city of Seattle during a general strike were the topics of one challenging meeting after another. Finally, on the morning of Thursday, February 6th, 1919, at 10 a.m., the Seattle General Strike commenced. About 60,000 people went on strike that morning. One of America's biggest cities and the hub of the Northwest came to a sudden standstill, and life as they knew it came to a virtual stop. The unions decided to put together 15 of their members as leaders. These leaders didn't realize until this point that they needed to figure out a way to get necessities. The strike went off without a hitch and everyone was able to get the things they needed, even though it was strike day. People in the community came together as one to help their fellow man like never before. Even though the city of Seattle was essentially shut down, the public could still obtain water and food from over 20 eating places around town, get milk for babies, medicine for the sick, electric power, sanitation, and limited transportation. Life was managed and orderly. Rumors had recently spread about violence occurring during the strike, but it wasn't true. A picture from the first day of the strike showing a group of people in the street was published in the newspaper. Many believed it was a mob, but in all actuality, this group was nothing more than peaceful strikers and their family members. Ole Hansen was the mayor of Seattle at the time of the Seattle general strike. Despite the fact that he considered himself the savior of Seattle and made it look as though he was for the people, he was not a proponent of the strike. Hansen was a hot-headed, flamboyant, and opportunistic, two-faced politician. He was a big Teddy Roosevelt supporter and even ran for the United States Senate himself. He threatened to enforce martial law against the people of the strike, even though he didn't actually have the authority to do so. Hansen deputized citizens with guns and irresponsibly turned them loose on the streets to go keep the peace. Even though there was no signs of violence, it was still believed violence was imminent. 
Because of this, soldiers were brought over from Camp Lewis as well. Thankfully for the city of Seattle, these troops were brought in under a man named Mayor General Morrison. He was adamant that if martial law was needed, he would be the one to declare it, and no one else, for he was not in the business of making hasty decisions. In spite of their efforts, the strike was crumbling from within. Everyday necessities were scarce, and strikers were feeling the pinch of lost wages. On the other side of the strike debate, there was Anna Louise Strong. She was an American journalist and activist during the Seattle General Strike, and was well known for her large support of communism in the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. Anna was also famous for her No One Knows Where editorial published in the Seattle Union Record on February 4th, 1919. She famously stated, We are undertaking the most tremendous move ever made by labor in this country. A move that will lead no one knows where. We do not need hysteria. We need the iron march of labor. Although Strong's editorial never mentioned what the goals of the strikers were, what their terms were, or whom the strike was against, her editorial became the most famous document of the general strike. Her passionate words made the biggest statement in justification of the general strike. She changed it into a drama, us versus them, the workers versus the capitalists. Conservatives saw it as completely threatening. This was the Bolshevik Revolution right here in the United States. In the end, one of the short-term benefits of the general strike was a very small rise in wages for the workers. Proving that the people could come together as one, living and thriving without the control of radical leadership, was another favorable outcome. Although newspapers from coast to coast, including Seattle newspapers, reported that the general strike in Seattle had lost, this was actually quite untrue. The History Committee of the General Strike Committee stated that hardly a word of regret was heard from the men who had lost five days pay for a cause. It was the men whose business had been hurt, the men who had expected riot and found none, who told them they had failed. Although workers did begin to see fair wages and the betterment of workers' rights as a result of the 1919 Seattle General Strike, the biggest long-term benefit came as a result of the way in which a community of people demonstrated human kindness and decency toward their fellow man during a crisis. And although there were no stated goals or motivated leadership, no specific enemies or set time limit for the strike to take place, each person was striking for what they thought was important. And each striker did this by coming together in solidarity as one voice for a cause they all believed in. In the end, the Seattle General Strike was a strike that proved to be all things to all men. Despite the fact that the 1919 Seattle General Strike was initiated because of a conflict over post-war wage disputes, the end result and compromise left a cultural legacy that continues to inspire many today. Even though the strike ended with only a few monetary gains for workers, the conflict that led to the strike remained mostly unresolved. However, the demonstration of American working class solidarity gave labor-owned businesses and cooperatives an important success story. With an entire city shut down, unionists had organized a whole network of worker-run services to take care of the people of Seattle during the strike. This successful act of workers' control is what made the Seattle General Strike of 1919 one of the most profound labor actions in American history.